Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. When we think of authoritarian leaders who run amok, a few come to mind. Mussolini, Hitler, Bolsonaro, Putin, Trump. If you study history, you'll find that they all follow a common playbook. They demand loyalty to their person rather than a party or principles. Denigrate the press and judiciary and consider themselves above the law. Does this sound familiar? I alone can fix it. Fake news. I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. Let's talk today with someone who wrote the book on strongmen. By the way, the name of the book is Strongmen. Well... Warm greetings, everybody. Glad to have you here. And uh, I'm very excited, uh, Greg and I both, to have uh, Dr. Ruth ben Giat on our podcast today. And you're a professor of uh, hi uh, history and Italian studies in New York. You're literally one of the leading uh, experts in the country on authoritarian leaders, fascism, and propaganda. And um, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I, I came across your I came across your book, uh, Strong Men. Uh, sent it to Greg. We both enjoyed it greatly. We've had other uh, people on regarding this topic similarly recently about the Proud Boys and one of actually our very first podcast was on how democracies die, which is a little bit similar to your to your theme. And this book is a wonderful book. It came out just before. Trump lost his second election. Is is that or second his election? Is that correct? It, it came out right after the election, like a week after. <laughs> um, so, and it's the first book that put Trump in historical perspective of a century of uh, right wing authoritarians. I, I have Gaddafi, who was very much a man of the left, but I I felt that there wasn't. Uh, a book that talked about, you know, fascism, and then what happens to all those right-wing impulses and, uh, you know, ideologies when fascism dies. And so I go through right-wing military coups, many of them backed by the U.S., up to people I call new authoritarians, you know, Orban, Bolsonaro, Putin, who used to be a communist, now is a fascist, and Trump. And I felt uh, writing this, uh, dealing, you know, as an American first generation, dealing with the effects of Trump on our democracy, I wanted to give a historical context because that's something that I can do. I, I don't know if I'm speaking for Greg, but after reading your book, I, I, I look differently at all of these politicians following uh, a very predictable playbook. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it's really it's really interesting and dismaying um, that many of them have a similar personality, uh, which meaning they're amoral. They will do anything necessary to get to power, and they watch what each other does. Um, and it's not like there's a written manual, but they all use what I identified um, as these tools of rule: propaganda, corruption violence, the myth of national greatness, and machismo, um, which I really wanted to include. So, so there's kind of, you know, playbooks for, for getting to power, which could be a, a military coup and, a, you know, an immediate thing. Or uh, Mussolini, who's the first person I examine, is very relevant today and, and not known as much as Hitler because he, he was appointed by the king after a lot of you know, fascist violence, but he was a prime minister for three years in a democracy. And the things he did, uh, you know, harassment and killing of uh, physical violence against opponents, election fraud, propaganda, creating a personality cult um, are tools that are being used today when people also today come to power. Uh, they come to power today during election through elections, and then they have to uh, chip away at the democratic system um, from within. Just for extra credit, Professor, I'm halfway through your book. Oh boy! And uh, and yeah. which is a a, a, found, a great foundation for your for this book that you, you've written, The Strong Men. And um, 
it he kind of I, I I learned so much from this that I didn't realize that how much he laid the foundation for this and was admired by Hitler, Churchill, mm -hmm. others really respected what he was doing in in Italy at the time. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, Mussolini, uh, you know, there are reasons that we all uh, know, uh, know uh, only or primarily about Hitler because of the Holocaust and the scale of what he did. But Mussolini laid down the template. It was the first, you know, right-wing dictatorship and, and, and it was the first dicta dictatorship in the absolute because, you know, Lenin died in 1924 and Stalin uh, and Mussolini it declares dictatorship in 1925, and and so this is uh, this is something that he's kind of making up as he goes along. But Hitler, um, who you know was not able to get to power so quickly, <laughs> it took him a whole you know decade, and nobody wanted to publish Mein Kampf. Uh, he was considered a total loser for a lot of the 1920s. He idolized Mussolini, um, and he his his beer hall putsch in 1923, which sent him to prison was modeled on the March in Rome, which was, uh, we just had the 100th anniversary. So M Mussolini was uh, also uh, the first right-wing dictator to be propped up by the United States. Now, we, we always think about, you know, Chile and Guatemala and all the Cold War uh, coups. But um, right after he declared dictatorship, Mussolini was given a $100 million loan from his admirers at what's today J.P. Mor Morgan. And he had a syndicated column for eight years, courtesy of the anti-communist Hearst organization. So he was an enormous international anti-communist icon. And he was highly influential uh, on other leaders and on populations all over the world. Greg, you've, uh, you, you sent me several articles that you wrote about um, uh, of fascism. Uh, Greg uh, has a pretty prolific blog and has been, um, uh, I, I would say a, a, an academic in the area of Marxist Leninist. Uh, how did you, from your work, Greg, with fascism and your thoughts, how did you think it connected um, with this book and, and the themes that were portrayed in this book? First, first, can you hear me, Pat? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. That's how bad we, we, we fixed that. Yeah, I approach fascism from the perspective of. Uh, what generates fascism, classical fascism, historic fascism. I think that's what's fascinating. And, and I enjoy hearing about, uh, uh, I mean, I enjoyed discussing Mussolini because that is a, a, a key component of fascism, the origins of fascism. But I locate fascism essentially in the, in the threat from the left. Uh, historical fascism almost always arises in the 30s and 40s, uh, whether it's in Italy or G Germany or whether it's even in Finland with Mannerheim, whether it's in Hungary, all the places where these movements grew, even in England with the, uh, uh, a fascist sort of party, they, they represent a, a uh, response to the left and the growth of the left. So you combine an economic crisis uh, in the 30s with, with uh, the rise of the left in Germany, for example, where you have a communist party actually getting growing as fast as fa even faster than the national social democrat socialist democratic organization the, the hitlerites and that threat generates unleashes fascism where fascism is a kind of restrained thing um and that's i think certainly true in in, in italy as well so when we look at right-wing movements i try to locate where they come from what spurs them sure. and so when i look at trump for example i will look at trump in the same way what is it that inspired? What is it that generated? What are the conditions that lead up to a phenomenon like Trump? And so that 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 fascinates me. Yeah, um, a there was an anti-fascist Italian anti-fascist who had to go into exile. Uh, he was a literature scholar, Giuseppe Borghese, and he in 1937 he published a book denouncing what was going on and he called it the scarlet phantom that even if you don't have the threat of a left, uh, fascists have to admit. And so I've been following, of course, a lot of my writing is on what's going on today with the GOP. And so I, I think I tweeted about two months ago that 2023 was gonna be 
you know, commies 24 seven on Fox News, the threat of commies. And so sure enough, um, and here it's not like the 30s. Um, I mean, Italy had the largest socialist party before fascism came in. It, um, and, uh, but, but you have the GOP that just uh, passed an quote, anti-socialist resolution. Uh, and so they're having to, in, in order to prepare people, you know, appetite for right-wing autocracy, which is what they're trying to do, um, they have to have the scarlet phantom. So I keep going back to that, that uh, concept of Borghese, uh, who learned the hard way, <laughs> but there, there was a real, I mean, original fascism took, you know, place uh, right after the Russian Revolution, the revolution spreading again italy had the largest socialist movement there were factory occupations and so it was a kind of a mini civil war and the fascists used violence we know the history but then they had to keep the threat after all the socialists and communists were driven into exile or into prison like gramsci they had to keep the threat of quote international bolshevism going but that that actual history uh, means that you know it's important to know to understand this kind of totally fake scarlet the phantom that the GOP today is is um, is trying to you know perpetuate uh, and and fool the American public um, and so everything becomes socialism. Biden's a socialist for you know even protecting uh, health insurance, and we can only hope that people don't fall for it uh, again. Well, I think yeah. I, I... And that's that's a good point about uh, about they create and invent the fan, but in the case of uh, of that resolution that uh, was passed in the in the House, eighty six Democrats voted for it. Oh. Fourteen Democrats uh, abstained, uh, were present, uh, voted present, and four four were absent. So you have what that's over a hundred of the Democratic delegation because there's a long history of anti communism in this country. Yeah, it's easy to easy to resurrect, easy to raise. Uh, so it's to, to, uh, what do you think about this? Let me ask you this question. I kind of attributed Nazism's rise because the, actually the Nazi Party was was shrinking electorally just before 1933 yeah. and 29 election, and then of course they started to pick up again. The Communist Party actually was larger than the, 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 yeah. the Nazi Party vote at that time. So, so, but what really fueled in addition, I mean, it's not only, but in addition was the economic circumstances. The Weimar Republic had no response to the economy. The Social Democratic Party had no response to the economy, so on and so forth. Isn't that similar today? I mean, isn't the rise of the right, the Trumpite right, doesn't it associate, doesn't it follow the, the development of inequality in this country? country, the vast growth of inequality in this country, and the economic crisis of 2007-9, and the deindustrialization. I mean, aren't those economic factors as much, perhaps more at this particular time, a factor in the rise of Trump than even this red baiting? They, they, they are, although there's so many studies that have come out cons uh, you know, subsequently that show that, quote, economic anxieties uh, were, were important, but they were eclipsed often by racial anxieties. It's it's a package, and yeah. one thing that um, you know is is really important is that just as uh, you know the, the the Democrats did not address themselves um, to um, what Trump very savvily called the forgotten, right? And the Democratic and this is something that's a problem with center left all over the all over the world now. They're perceived in Italy too and as too elitist. And they're not really connected to the actual concerns of uh, working class people. And, um, and now there's a counter move in the Democratic Party with younger, some younger people. But Trump was very, very smart to address himself, uh, not only to extremists, to the whole, all the racist caravan, you know, all the people who uh, he knew he could kind of make a private army of thugs and use them on January 6th. But to these people who are hurting, and, and it's really been the right rather than the center left that's known how to use emotion, these demagogues, they're very smart. And we have to, like, um, it's not giving them credit. It's just acknowledging that they, they are they're very good at manipulating people. So when Trump said, I love you, you, are, you were forgotten and you're forgotten no longer, this is, inc this is incredibly 
um, effective. And it's the same things that, you know, Mussolini did at the very beginning. He'd been a socialist and then he certainly wasn't. He, one of the first things he did was privatize, um, which nobody knows or remembers. And I put that in my book because he, he used, we can talk about the role of elites, right? Uh, very, very important conservative elites. But um, we, can, we can think about, uh, you know, reforms that need to be made within the Democratic Party in order to uh, recapture um, a relationships with people who are hurting economically. And you know who was doing that quite successfully in his recent campaign for Senate, John Fetterman. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there are templates and things we can watch to to reform this, but it's it's been a big problem and and the the emotional way that um, leaders like Orban or Erdogan who cries a lot, or Trump, you know, it's all simulated. They hate their people. They just want to rob them and lie to them. But, and I'm not saying Democrats should start to lie to people, but they, they seem to connect with people and they seem to be authentic in expressing care. And we, we need to learn from, from that and actually do it based on values of solidarity and, you know, uh, care about economic inequality. You know, I, I think, Greg, from reading your articles you sent me on fascism, I think I, I get your point that this this comes that the the, the flame is lit. Uh, it's lit by this economic uncertainty and by failure of capitalism. And um, but what I really liked about your book is is it is it there see it's almost as if they open up a manual and once they have those conditions, they go to they have some go tos. For example, the the, yeah. the the sexism, you know, the 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 their their shirts off and and their hyper masculinity and uh, e e exploiting gays and women. That's a that's a script that's everywhere. Um, it, it, with these people, it's with Trump, it's with Putin, it's with Mussolini. It's you know um, that that that's. That's one check. That's one check mark that seems to be at at, at play. Um, the remarkable use of propaganda and how you put you you said that in your book with you know both Hitler and um, well obviously Trump with Twitter and who who's the fellow that does Instagram? And <laughs> um, Modi, yeah, go see Modi's Instagram. He and and the, the I think I have a sentence in the book that. The paradox is the more they are skilled at this um, artifice of using the latest, they always use the latest technologies. So Hitler, it was radio. And, and uh, after the book came out, I discovered um, more research on this that um, Siemens and, uh, and Blaupunkt and all these German technology companies actually were hired by the Nazis to make um, to make state-of-the-art speakers so that Hitler's voice would be like more reverberating and emotional. So they, and Mussolini was so skilled at, you know, acting at newsreels. And so Modi, um, he Instagrams his life. Um, he has an app uh, and, and so whatever the technology is and Trump with Twitter, Bolsonaro with Twitter, they know how to exploit it to have a direct communication channel with the people. And, and Chavez did this uh, also uh, on in through radio, right? They have radio programs, depending on how how people are most getting their information. Um, if if uh, more people listen to radio than they do radio even today. Um, so that's important, this direct communication with people that is unmediated makes people bond to them. And we see in Brazil with the insurrection at January 6th, how important it is to have this demagogue personality cult because once people bond, history shows that it, it's very difficult for them to come out of it. And, and in Italy and Germany, it took being bombed by the allies and that was the one party states and really a closed media system, fine. But it took an extreme demonstration of like that these governments were not miraculous after all to get people to start um, insulting the Fuhrer in public and starting to say, well, hey, maybe I was fooled. I think you have to, you also have to 
to uh, uh, account for the uh, the corruption of the media, of the mainstream media in most of these places. I mean, certainly uh, people lose their confidence in the mainstream media. Uh, and as they lose that confidence and they become more cynical about what they're hearing from other people, then it's not uncommon for people to grasp at or grow towards things that are that are different, that, that are speaking to them and, and that, that are, uh, reflect their pain. So, you know, right. you, you look at uh, Lenny Rippenstahl, Rippenstahl was a genius, but she was, she was the genius, not Hitler. But once he attached himself to her and what she could do, that became a, a, a weapon in his hands. But you have the same thing in this country. I mean, it's been, we the media has been weaponized because the mainstream media has been so discredited. People don't really believe in it. Well, the, the discrediting is a purposeful strategy that way before Trump came in, uh, the Tea Party and part of the GOP was trying to get people to, the very, the very phrase mainstream media is a right-wing phrase that's used. Um, also, also left-wing, but it's a phrase that's designed to um, make people see the media as as very corrupt it's, and and in fact you know often they haven't acquitted themselves very well um, one of the reasons i kind of converted my whole professional life to um doing the hundreds of interviews every year was to to try and uh, help people to understand what was happening because the media um was often slow to catch on and in this country uh it's because there was this idea that it can't happen here uh, that were protected, and they had no reference point for seeing Trump as an authoritarian. And when I started, I started writing about him in 2015. And I remember I wrote a piece in January 2016 about saying that he would have a personality cult if he got the nomination, which was like months and months away. And I also talked about Berlusconi, who ruled in a democracy, and I also talked about Putin. I was like, here's how they work. We've got all the signs that this is going to happen. Nobody would publish it because it seemed totally outlandish that to associate this idea of a personality cult with Trump. And so I had to open a blog on Huff Huffington Post, which like if you were a accredited, accredited person, you could do. And that's how I got that published. So I'm, it's an anecdote to say that there was no space at the very beginning to recognize Trump as authoritarian or the GOP as an autocratic party. And so the media, that didn't help the media um, being able to call out things in the time they needed to. And, and the media is their own greatest enemy at this time. I mean, look at what Matt Taibbi is discovering with the Hamilton 68 project and how the Twitter um, literally lied and complicit in this is the New York Times, all of these other um, large mainstream legacy medias. And, you know, that rather than covering that, that just fuels the, it's all fake news. You can't trust anybody. So you have to trust me because I'm the, I'm the one that can really help sort this, sort this out. Um, well, well, but Matt Taibbi is working for Elon Musk, who's a fascist troll and trying to train, to convert Twitter into right-wing radicalization engine. So I'm not a fan of him. Um, and I, it, of course, we can criticize the New York Times, and I often do, but um, they have done superb investigative journalism of Trump. Uh, it's a very large operation, and it has many parts right. to it. Right. But uh, I, I think that uh, Mr. Matt is completely discredited by working for uh, Elon Trump. Elon Trump. There we go. <laughs> I, in fact, I tweeted in April when Musk first was, you know, uh, he this is months before he right. uh, was buying tw buying Twitter that he was going to try and occupy the place that Trump used to have uh, producing garbage. That's the word I used and having everything swirl around him. And, and that is what he's tried to do. And he's trying to change the narrative. He has a very sophisticated understanding, just like Trump, of how you shift people's mindsets. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we differ on, on that point. Well, yeah, but there are others. I mean, there's the re most recent uh, Columbia Journalism Review uh, a study of Russia which just came out and yeah. uh, was written by a former New York Times yeah. uh, writer. 
and uh, but it's 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 a pile, as you said earlier about how to look at fascism. It's a pile of things, a lot of different ingredients that go into discrediting the media. And there are two questions: is one whether it is trustworthy or not. Where I'd fall on the I'd fall on the side of saying it isn't. No, I'm not a Trumpite. And the other question is whether the people trust it or not. And they're different right. questions. Yeah, that's and true. And I think what's happened. I think you're right, and that 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 the Fox News and actually the removal of this fairness doctrine many years ago is more responsible than even Fox News. But Fox News has picked up on it. They were the first to jump on it. That's created the lack of trust. Now, is that trustworthiness? Everybody has an opinion, but certainly there is a growing lack of trust. Our institutions. There's a uh, Daniel J. Edelman, uh, an associate study. A trust barometer is done every year. It's the largest public relation firm in the world. And the, 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 the odd thing is, to many people, this would be odd. The country that has the highest trust in its institutions in that Edelman study is China. And the huh. U.S. is in the distrust, distrust category. And of course, Pew and all the other polls show the institutions in the U.S. are in disrepute. I mean, I think the police... The military, and, and I don't agree with this, but the police and the military have a high regard as an institution, but the media, Congress, very, very low. So it's, it is complicated. It's a very complicated question to figure out uh, just how we got to where we are. I think the Chinese, Chinese uh, trust is changing, uh, uh, okay. which the protest show is also, uh, they're not answering those questions in a very open environment in China. Right. Um, but I think that that, that is changing. Um, uh, you talked about the virility before. I did want to go back to, to that because um, it's very easy for us to not take seriously, you know, Putin puffing up his, his muscles and stripping his shirt off. And, and the reason I devoted a whole chapter to it is I, I felt that it's actually deadly serious. Mm -hmm. And when I looked, you know, at the literature on authoritarianism, um, there's tons of things on gender and politics, but I saw that the kind of the the works that are talking about how to wreck dictatorships or autocrats playbooks they don't really they didn't really go into it and instead it's extremely important if we talk about corruption which is a central to authoritarianism because the the leader isn't just um he's the man of the people and that's where we go back to like modi instagramming his life and putin is you know in those pictures where he has no shirt he's fishing you know, Franco used to like be seen on TV going hunting and being a grandfather. So they're the man of the people, but very important, they're the man above all other men. Mm. They're untouchable, they're omnipotent. And how does this connect to corruption? They're the men who get away with it. They get away with things, no one can touch them. And so that's Putin who has a, a full-blown kleptocracy. And that was an appeal of Trump. And, and it's why um, when the Access Hollywood tapes came out right before the election, I was like, oh, this is probably just going to raise his popularity that, that yeah, he was caught. Yeah, and this yeah. was years ago, right? It was the, the tapes were from years before he ran for office, but he was saying that he could grab anybody anywhere. He could do whatever he wanted because he's a star. And this is men and women look up to the man who can has it all, the most beautiful women, the richest. And this fantasy of being able to do anything you want and getting away with it. And so what you see over when you track um, what happens to countries who have a leader like Trump, if, if he's not prosecuted, you see the whole society can shift into uh, supporting people who are lawless, who are criminals, and so I track the GOP very closely. Who's coming into the GOP? Well, lo and behold, we got George Santos, who's a total fraudster. And that's that's actually makes sense. Um, also, we have uh, anti-government extremists like Oath Keepers who are high officials in the GOP. So you have lawless criminals who, <laughs> who become the lawmakers as a result of having uh, an icon 
who says I can get away with anything. And then the out the, the outcome is is what we saw is is violence, is corruption, is January 6th. Um, in Modi's India, uh, I saw a study that in 2019, there were 10 members of uh, their equivalent of parliament who had open cases of murder, who were, they, they were accused of murder and their cases were open. Um, and, and like another dozen criminals, people with criminal records. So in Strongman, I talk about how these people, like a regular politician, if you have, if you're under investigation, the mentality would be like, I'm not gonna run for office, I'll be under scrutiny, I'm gonna lie low. Strong men, whether it's uh, Putin, Berlusconi, Netanyahu, Trump, all of them run for office while they're under investigation. And the purpose is to get in power and to shut down any investigations um, so that they feel safe. Hungary, they did that effectively. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, with all the judges. I, tell me to what degree uh, Fox News and other conservative news entities that develop this kind of relationship with these authoritarians, to what degree are they um, part, of the, part of the problem? And I, I say this because one of the documentaries that I, I really loved a couple of years ago was The Brainwashing of My Dad, How the Right Wing mm -hmm. Media Changed My Father. and, and mm -hmm. And I have so many dear friends that Me too. I, I care about so much, and yet they get their information strictly from just a couple of news sources that are, um, I, I, you know, Fox News. How does that contribute to this phenomenon too, especially when the mainstream media does fall on its face occasionally with, with, with you know, uh, problems? One of the biggest uh, dangers we have is that the right has a very um, effective uh, media machine, propaganda machine, and they have a unity of messaging. They all say the same thing. And Tucker Carlson is truly, I don't use the F word all the time, but he is a fascist demagogue. If, we, if, we, if, if things go even very badly here, and we have to list the top three people, he's gonna be one of the three uh, of why. For example, he, um, he's constantly you know, uh, getting people into a feverish state of hatred and anxiety. He talked about, uh, the New York Times actually did a, an incredible interactive study, took them, took them like uh, months and months, that he mentioned great replacement theory, which is the fear that uh, non-whites are gonna have so many you know, babies that whites will be extinguished uh, 400 times on his show. And propaganda works through repetition. You have to hear it over and over and you have to hear the message from different people. Um, you always have a central person, like he's like the Goebbels uh, yeah. who's delivering it. But then you have it, um, the Nazis called the synchronization. Different people uh, reach different audiences with a slight variation on the message. And if you look at the right-wing media machine in its entirety with Fox as the center, that's what they do. Um, and so no wonder, you know, what are all the polls? Half of Americans think that violence is necessary and justified. And, and just so Tucker Carlson has been telling them that and, and also spinning these conspiracy theories, making people feel that um, it's not just polarization where you'd agree to disagree like the old days, it's what I call survivalism, that it's me or you, and only one of us is going to survive. And that's what great replacement theory says. He also is trying to go back to the economic question, consistently telling people to lose trust in the American economy, that democracy doesn't work, that Orban you know, is, is, is the answer instead that uh, your cities are uh, full of you know, anarchy and crisis. My mother was radicalized in England, not by Fox News during the pandemic, by watching RT, Kremlin mm -hmm. propaganda, Russia Today. Mm -hmm. And she would call me, but it's the same, they use the same footage, actually. It's really scary. They use, uh, they use the same footage as Fox. And so she would call me living in New York City and saying, aren't you afraid to go out of the door? because of anarchy and crime. And I'm like, no, mom, look. And I would send her pictures of my <laughs> street looking very calm with people shopping. And, and so it, it's, 
it's the disinformation um, warfare and the information warfare is uh, is is one of the major reasons that democracies die today. But that's a media issue because, for example, the, the crime issue is number one or number two on almost every poll. But it, it's it's counterfactual. I mean, the it's, yes, it is. Last, last week there were two two um, studies. One was the chief of police organization, but I forget what the other one was. But they both showed that murders were down in this country by five percent in the last year. If that's you right. watch media, and I won't use mainstream media, I'll use monopoly media because that's the way I okay, I that's a good view it. They they make everybody in this country. It's not just RT. I mean, RT could pick yeah. up a feed from. U.S. Uh, media and repeat it, and they would be saying that. Aren't you afraid to go out in the streets? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean people are afraid to go anywhere. They're well, afraid to that's go. it's psychological. But I also want to. It's psychological warfare, um, and uh, and and the other half is that what's really scary. I've observed. So so Tucker Carlson is also what I call an authoritarian enforcer because the GOP. Um, is, and I'm trying to um, really, in all the interviews I do, get this message out that the GOP is, acts like an autocratic party now. It's an authoritarian party. And they have a party line. They really do. And that's why they're so effective. Right. Um, Democrats with a small D, we don't have a party line, right? You know, that's why AOC says, well, hi, you know, if we, this were a different country, I wouldn't be in the same um, party as Biden. Right, but you can't do that in the GOP. So one really significant um, episode, which I found chilling because I know how these systems work, is Ted Cruz made a mistake, and he um, he said that the January six had been a domestic terrorist operation. Well, that you're not supposed to do. So Tucker Carlson hauled him onto a show. And in real time, he's got the most watched primetime show. He humiliated him mm -hmm. and, and berated him. And what was so scary to me is like, I, I don't like Ted Cruz. He's, he's horror. He's part of the problem, right? But his senatorial credentials meant nothing to Tucker Carlson. And you could see the discomfort and the fear in Cruz's eyes because he was being humiliated in real on live television. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, he's the authoritarian enforcer. And there are lots of people in communist history and fascist history who played this role. Um, and, and there were show trials. And in Gaddafi, you had to come on TV and, and confess your in, in tra uh, infractions uh, in law on live television. And I was like, really, are we going here? Um, but apparently we are. Well, we've been there. I mean, in the McCarthy era, that was yes. a common to go before HUAC on television. Yes, and, exactly. And not only confess your sins, but also implicate your friends. But I have a question. Exactly. Both you and Pat use the term authoritarian, authoritarianism. And I must say, I'm a little bit skeptical about it. I'm not sure how broad it is or how narrow you see it. But I would agree that Trump I want to use uh, academic terms or nice terms. Trump is a right-wing populist. Uh, he's he's a, a poseur. He's he's manipulated. I would agree that all the people you mentioned earlier uh, are in that category. I would add Ronald Reagan, who loved to ride on his horses and chop wood and be a common person, and so on and so on. And George Bush, who was at the paint, and Bill Clinton, who had his populist. Uh, uh, Pazur kind of I'm a man of the people moments as well. So I would add all these into that, that whatever authoritarianism might be in your mind, certainly uh, Modi, etc. But what about Zelensky? Putin certainly is in that mode. I give you that, concede it. I'm not a fan of Putin's. What about Zelensky? They have outlawed 11 political parties. The FLCIO just this past week sent out a missive to people saying, we were betrayed by, by Zelensky because we support the trade union movement in, in Ukraine and they're cracking down on it. He's, he's a populist in the sense that he goes on television every opportunity. Uh, he appeals to, be, uh, to the people. There's, there has been since 19, since 20, uh, 
well, actually since 20, 2000, or, well, since 90, 90 uh, since uh, 99, there's been nothing but corruption in Ukraine. Do you view Zelensky, either of you view Zelensky as this kind of a figure? Does it fit in the authoritarian mode? Well, you, you're, uh, you're, you're in, encapsulating all the Putin talking points about Zelensky, except you haven't called him a Nazi. I don't think you're going to do that. No, um, I do, but, <laughs> but there, is, there is a Nazi problem in Ukraine. and that's Well, the there problem. we go. Well, I, I'm just going to agree about, to disagree. What about, what about uh, all the opposition parties are banned? It, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to agree to disagree. Uh, his country is occupied. Uh, there you have wartime emergency measures. His country is uh, subject to, uh, what if somebody came into the U.S. and wanted to annihilate all, U all of the U.S. and had a genocidal warfare? Uh, I think that... Um, it, I don't, I don't, I just don't agree with the premise at all. I, I think that it's, uh, I will not subscribe to Putin talking points. Um, so I'm not going to answer that further. Maybe Pat can intervene. Well, I, I think you're on the wrong track here, Greg. I, I think the point of, the point of this book is a hundred years of these strong men that include the fascists, includes the military takeover in South America, and it includes this new hybrid authoritarian kind of thing that we see going on in Brazil and Hungary and United States. I, you, can, you can go on the checklist, on the mendacity checklist and check off things with Zelensky and that, that's fine, you know, the corruption and the uh, lack of democracy and all of that. But I don't, um, and maybe he could grow up to be a strong man, <laughs> you know, in, in the future. But I, I think you're, the, the, as I saw the point of your, your book that helped me understand this so much is that there, there, are, there are so many clear behaviors that these people generally follow that puts them in that, that, that power. And one of the most terrifying things that I found in your book is how popular these people are. I mean, truly, Putin is popular in his country uh, and in Chile when they threw out that horrible uh, person. Uh, he had a he had a high popularity rate. Hitler had high popularity rate. Trump's probably going to be our next president. So even these these techniques, as bad as they are for democracy, tend to work. They tend to have. They tend to have legs. I don't know. Am I am I am I doing a fairly good job in my book report, Professor? Or what do you what do you think? I mean, they um, first of all, like populism is a very broad thing, and any many types of people from left, Democrat, and right can be populists. However, the authoritarian playbook is when that populism is uh, linked to state sanctioned policies that exploit murder uh, and lie to citizens. So Putin uh, is was indeed popular due to the e efficacy of his propaganda, uh, his sex symbol, his idea that he was, which turned out as we see from the Ukraine war, it's just the Russian military's uh, been ravaged by corruption. And whenever we say Putin, we must say kleptocracy. He has the most developed kleptocracy since Gaddafi and Mobutu. Um, and he treats, in fact, uh, he treats his, uh, he, he despises the people he governs, which is why he siphons off all and plunders all of the, uh, you know, Gazprom and all of the state agencies and siphons off the profits with his hol oligarchs uh, uh, into offshore accounts. He's worth 500 billion. He's now worth more than Gaddafi was. Um, so, that that's that context to see how these tools work together the lying the stealing with the the kind of appearance of populism that's where that's you can't just cherry pick and take one out um bill clinton uh is did many things that were egregious but he was not um like trump he was not indebted to giant bank flows to china he wasn't in bed with putin he didn't um, you know, uh, support autocrats. I mean, you, you do know that the Clinton administration got Yeltsin elected 
in 19, uh, when was it, 1996, 1995, they arranged an IMF loan so he could run. He was going to lose the election. Of course, they got involved. All U.S. Uh, leaders have, have been involved in this. But all, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is the term authoritarianism, unlike Hannah Arendt's term, totalitarianism, which had a structural basis. That is, it, 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 whether I agree with it or not, it did have a structural basis. Totalitarian regimes did not have a party system, a parliament. They were one party, so on and so on and so forth. They were a Cold War product, that, that concept. Authoritarianism is a slippery notion. And I, I threw Zelensky out because, in fact, two weeks ago, he, he admitted that the, that the regime was corrupt. He fired half of the cabinet. Half of the underlings in his cabinet were fired because of corruption. As the result. But and authoritarians would not fire them because of that's corruption. A good thing. That's yes, a good, that's yeah. a good thing. Anyway, I, I, have to, I, I have to conclude. Well, um, listen, thank you so much for spending time with us. And I know you're busy. And uh, this has been a real treat for me. And I, I want to link to your Lucid uh, uh, um, yes. uh, sub, Substack. And your, uh, your, I, I, I participated in your Friday meeting the other day. It was absolutely wonderful. It was like thank being you. back in college and grad school, hanging out with my professors. And so thank you. And I appreciate it much. And keep keep at keep at it you're, you're you, it's a very good fight you're fighting and i appreciate it thank you thanks thank so much you. thanks for the dialogue bye bye, -bye. bye.